Good morning, good morning. How's everybody feeling this morning? Y'all know me better than that. You already know. How y'all doing this morning? Wonderful. You look beautiful. You look like you lose a little weight, got your hair done, looking good, getting ready for school to get back in session. How many of your kids are excited to go back to school? <laughs> that's, that's what I thought. <laughs> So we are in week five of our series, Epic Church. And if you're just joining us, we are journeying together through the book of Acts. Make sure that you pick up, we have here what's called a life guide. And it is a devotional that you can pick up and read along with us throughout the week. It'll actually prepare you for next week. So if you haven't done that this week, get the life guide on your way out. Now, I know that we're starting school and, you know, my wife and I were kind of scrambling around to make sure we get all the last minute preparations. I know a lot of parents are probably doing the same thing. And it dawned on me that, you know, I used to periodically have a a moment where I would come up and kind of confess something about myself. And I feel like, you know, it's been a while since I've had a confession. So I think I need to make a confession this morning since we're getting ready to start school. Now, this hasn't always been the case. And what I'm about to tell you is no surprise to our teenagers. They've known me for three years. They know how I am. But here's a confession that I want to give you this morning in light of the fact that we're starting school. You you ready for my confession? I'm a nerd. And, no? (laughs) Now, you know, back in the day that wasn't cool to say, right? Now I found like our kids kind of wear that as a banner. You know, you have your jocks, you have, you know, your gamers, and then you have your nerds. And there's a lot of kids now who are actually proud of that, but our kids here know that because I'm the guy who will take them to Six Flags and take books and read all day while they ride rides. <laughs> and, I, and I realize that, you know, there's, there's probably a real big reason why I consider myself a nerd. Like, I, I was a kid, that wasn't the case. And I can tell you how I kind of transformed. My mom helped me transform into somebody who cares about academics. Because here's another confession. When I was younger, my freshman year in high school, and I'm, and I'm not glorifying this at all, teenagers, but I got kicked out of school for not going to school. And so now you see, you see why I have such a push for academics. <laughs> because I got home one day, my mom got a letter, and she found out that I had been skipping class. And I remember the day I came home, I was 15 years old. It was the last time I got, my parents believed in corporal punishment. <laughs> and I can remember I came home, the door was closed, and the, my door to my room was never closed, and I came in, and my mom was sitting on the bed with the letter that she had got from the school that I had not been going to school. And she threw the letter at me, and I was foolish enough to bend over to try to pick it up. <laughs> Long story short, that's why we have college tours and tutoring here. Because <laughs> I believe in education from that moment forward. And so from that moment forward, I kind of turned into a nerd. But here's, here's why I think that has been part of my personality, is because I love history. I love to read, and so I was telling my wife, as I'm reading through the book of Acts, I'm, I'm getting a kick out of it because it contains a whole lot of history. Like, I'm the type of person who loves to watch the History Channel. I love, I love to watch how stories are forming and how things are made. I love all these different things where we, can, where we can kind of sit back and watch a story unfold. And here's the reality that most of you laugh at me, but you're kind of a nerd, too. Because everybody likes a good story, right? That no matter where you are in life, no matter whether you like to read books or, or watch movies, we all love to hear a great story, especially a story where it's history in the making. Something, some event, some, some catalyst that, that begins to change the course of history. We all love to hear a great story. We all like to hear a story of victory, someone who overcame, someone whose life changed. We all love stories. And one of the great things about Acts chapters 13 through 15 is that we get what I believe is one of the most historical moments in this movement called the church. This moment that we're about to read, that we're about to study together, actually changed the course of history. As a matter of fact, it was so historical that that is the reason why we sit in the church this morning. And it's a story that is worth taking your time to read through. It's worth looking at, we just saw the video of the council at Jerusalem, it's worth really digging into that story because the only reason why we're able to sit in the church here in the West is because there was a decision that was made so many thousands of years ago that impacted us, it actually created a new story. 
And Paul, in chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, begins off his missionary journey. Last week, remember, Pastor Larry talked about the lordship of Jesus Christ, and we ran into this guy named Paul. And then as we run into chapter 13, we find that Paul was sent to the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, they, it says that in chapter 13, hopefully you did your homework, that they were sitting around and they were praying and fasting and the Holy Spirit told them, I want you to send Paul and Barnabas off to the Gentiles on a special mission. I want them to begin to preach the gospel to people other than us. Now that's a big deal because for them, and remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Larry said it, it took 10 plus years for the gospel to move outside of Jerusalem. But here comes another historical event. Finally, they begin to recognize that Jesus says, you need to preach the gospel to all nations, and we're going to now, through the Holy Spirit, appoint some people to do that. And that's big for us because the only reason why we're here is because they listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, don't miss that because I think sometimes if I can make this an individual part of the sermon, I think sometimes we miss out on how big our life really could be because we just don't tune in to what God is asking us to do. You know, this, this is a big, big decision because of the fact that they sat and they listened and they waited on God and they allowed the Holy Spirit to tell them where to go and who to talk to and how to spread this mission that it actually became something so much bigger. The story was continuing to be written, but it happens when we listen to God. And so they sit around and they're praying and they're fasting and it talks about that they are sent out because the Holy Spirit has, has prompted them to send out Barnabas and Paul, and then they go out and they preach. And here's, here's what I like about the chapter 13, is that when Paul gets to his destination, they go into the church house, and some of the officials there ask Paul, do you have any words of encouragement to share with the people? It's in chapter 13. And then Paul stands up, and the people are quieted, and Paul begins to preach. The, primarily, the whole chapter of chapter 13 covers his sermon, and Paul begins to preach to the people in the synagogue. And it's something interesting that happened. Paul begins with history. The Paul begins, he goes all the way back from the beginning. He talks about God and how he was the God who chose a specific people and how he was a God who began to work in the lives of his Jewish people. Well, Paul didn't start where they were. He started with history. And here's what I like about that. Is that what Paul is trying to do is something that is extremely important for us to understand, and that is being able to recognize the God of history. So you don't miss that. I, I remember the church that I grew up in. Uh, they used to sing this song that said, when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that the Lord has made a way and I have a testimony. And Paul is saying, look, what I want you to understand first and foremost is, is that God chose you. If you look back and you think back hard enough, you can find God in your history. Even when you weren't thinking about him, even when I wasn't thinking about him, even when I found myself in a position where I was totally running from God, here's what Paul says. Let me start from the beginning. God has always been there. And you think it's because of your rules and your regulations. You think it's because you follow this and you follow that. You think it's because Moses gave you the Ten Commandments. But he's saying, look, even before you knew anything about God, God chose you. And I, I just want to pause just for a second. Just pause for a second and take 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds to think about all the times in your life. And maybe you didn't understand it at that time and maybe you didn't realize it at the time, but I'm willing to bet you there's a part of your story where you can look back and say, you know what, that was God. You remember the story in, in the Old Testament when Moses is getting ready to take the people over to the promised land and he asked God, he says, you know what, God, we're not going to go unless we know you're with us and I need you to show me your glory. God says, look, I can't show you who I am because if you see my face, it'll kill you. I'm too overwhelming. I'm too awesome. I'm too glorious. But here's what I'm going to do for you, Moses. I'm going to set you in a rock, and when I set you in the rock, I'm going to remove my hand, and you're going to see my back. And the word that, that, that is used for back actually means residue. It means that you can see the evidence that I've been there. Now, now, here's what Paul is doing. He's saying, look, no matter what it is that you have faced in your life, I'm willing to bet that if you take time, you will see the residue and the effects 
that God has been in your life throughout the course of your history? Y'all too quiet for me. Because when I, when I think about where I was 10 years ago, it had to be God. When I think about what I was doing 12 years ago and, and how I was living and the things and the choices that I made, and I look back over the course of my life, there's no way possible in life that I would be standing before you today except for the fact that God is in my history. Somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> Listen, you got, you got to know that it doesn't matter what you've been through or where you've been, a part of your story has always been that God is in your history. Paul starts off in a place where he says, look, I want you guys to understand, don't get it twisted. It's not because of you. It's been the fact that God has been in your history. Listen to what he says in Acts 13, chapter 4, or Acts chapter 13, verse 42. Acts chapter 13, verse 42, he says, it says, Luke records it, it says, as Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, they, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Paul must have been preaching good. He said, we want to invite you back next week. And then Luke says, and many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. Here it is. It is the beginning stages of the church beginning to form their theology surrounding grace. And Paul says, if you look back in your history long enough, and if you look at some of the parts of the story of your life, you will realize that God is gracious. Come on, think about it. You remember that accident you were in a couple of years ago? It should have killed you. Or how about that illness that your family member recovered from and everybody thought it was over and everybody had sit you down for the count and you look back over your life and you realize that God's grace is sufficient. Paul says, if you think about it hard enough, if you think about it, I know you think you're the chosen people. I know you think you got it all together. But if you think about it hard enough, God has been there from the beginning and it's only because of his grace. The only reason that we even know who to turn our hearts towards is because there's a grace that prepares your heart to even understand who God is. The only reason we know that we're supposed to be following God is because God has extended us a grace. And Paul says, let me start with history because the God of history has been so gracious to you that you can't deny that God is a part of your story. He takes people who are devout Jews and they are very strict on their laws and very strict on all the things that they thought made them religious. And Paul says, let's back up just a second. And let's realize that even before you had the law and even before you knew you were the chosen people, God has been a part of your story. Just think about it for 20 seconds. Think about where you were five years ago. Think about what you were doing seven years ago. Think about how you thought two weeks ago. God is a God of history. That no matter how I slice it, if I look back over my life and I think about it hard enough, God has extended grace to me. Paul starts off with saying that, you know what, God is a God of history. I want you guys to understand he must have been preaching good because they invited him to come back next week. But then he moves on. Paul and Barnabas leave Antioch and they head for Iconium and they face similar challenges. Remember, if you read the story, that there were some people who were not happy about the fact that Paul was preaching this whole idea of grace. We'll talk about it in a second. But this is a historical moment because for the first time, the church begins to gather around the idea that it's not about us. It's about the fact that God is writing a story that is so much bigger than us, and he's always been a part of our story. And if you think about it long enough, God has always been there. And Paul and Barnabas travel on to, to Iconium, and they faced similar challenges, but people were still getting saved. And here's what happens in Acts chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. We'll get to the council in just a second. Listen to what Luke records. He says, the same thing happened in Iconium. In other words, there are the same kind of challenges, the same kind of issues. People don't like this whole grace thing because here's the reality. Grace is messy. The fact that God can still save me and still love me even though I'm the biggest mess up that ever walked the face of this earth. It gets a little bit messy and all the officials, they didn't like it. They didn't like this idea of the fact that you're preaching the fact that people don't have to keep the rules to be saved. 
And so they face similar challenges. They go into Iconium, and Luke says the same thing happened in Iconium. And Paul and Barnabas went to the Jewish synagogue and preached with such power, and a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. And some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles. Here they go, against Paul and Barnabas. But the apostles stayed there for a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of of the Lord. Here's that word again that keeps coming up. It's about grace. See, it's a threat to the establishment when we start preaching that people can be saved without following our rules. It was a threat to the establishment when they started preaching that it is about faith and faith alone. It is a threat to the control of the church because we're preaching a message, Paul and Barnabas, that says it doesn't matter what walk of life you've come from, God still loves you and Jesus can save you and you don't have to become like us. That's, that's messy, isn't it? <laughs> but the reason why it's so epic is because that's the reason why you're sitting in the seat you're sitting in today. It's because they took seriously the call to preach the gospel to all nations, and guess what that means? That means eventually we got to get over ourselves. <laughs> Y'all missed it. <laughs> that there's something about your life that God wants to do, and until you get over yourself, it'll never be as big as it could be. That there's a story that God is writing for our lives, there's a story that God is writing for the lives of your family, for this church, and until we realize that it's only because of his grace and it's only because of the fact that God initiated this whole thing, it'll never be as big as a movement as God called it to be. And that, that's, that's a different way of, of thinking about it. it. It became a challenge for those who were in the first century because we kind of make the rules, don't we? We decide who gets in and who doesn't get in. And we decide who's good enough and who's not good enough. And all of a sudden, Paul and Barnabas start preaching this gospel of grace that says, you know what, you don't have to follow the rules because Jesus loves you anyway. And they go in and it says that, Luke says that they preach boldly about the grace of God and they had a lot of obstacles and it was the beginning stages of a strategy to help people understand that not only is God the God of history but God is a God in your history but watch what happens in Acts 14 Acts 14 verses 15 through verses 15 through 17 check out what happens and Luke records it like this. I'll actually start at 14. But when the apostles Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings. Remember, they're preaching now to some non-Jews. They're preaching to Gentiles. And what ends up happening is, is that the men, after they had a display of power through the Holy Spirit, the men and women of the town began to say that Paul and Barnabas must be gods. These are people who didn't understand God in the history. They're not people who were, quote unquote, under the covenant of the nation of Israel. And they didn't understand God. And they had all different kinds of religions. And they saw Paul and Barnabas do something miraculous. And they said, you know, you guys must be gods. And here's what Paul and Barnabas says. You know what? It's not about us. It's never been about us. As a matter of fact, don't do this. Don't worship us. We're trying to teach you something. We're trying to show you that it's not just a God of history. It's God in history. It's not us. Don't focus on us. It's all about Jesus. And then they go on to say, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings just like you. And we have come to bring the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, and check this out. Here they are. Now they're teaching the same strategy in the past. He permitted the nation to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. Here they are. Now they talk to the Jews. They said, you know what? God is a God of history. He's always been there. And then they talk to the Gentiles, the Gentiles who don't always get it right. They don't understand. It sounds kind of like us. That, you know what, I don't really get this whole God thing. I don't always understand it. And here's what they say. You know what, it's not about us. Don't look at us. Don't look at the preacher. Here's what I want you to understand, that God has always allowed you to make your own decisions, but it's not because he hasn't shown you who he is. And think about that just for a second, because he's, Paul says, you know what, God has let every nation go its own way. 
But all throughout the course of your history, you've seen evidence that God is who he says he is. And isn't that a great strategy? Isn't that a great way to talk to our friends and our family who don't understand this whole God thing? Even sometimes when we don't understand this whole God thing, this whole Jesus thing, it says, you know what? Let's go back and look over the course of your life. So no matter where you've come from, what you've experienced, whatever it is, here, here's the reality. God is not just a God of history. God has always been in your history. And if you think about it long enough, he says this, if you think about it long enough, even though you guys have done your own thing for many years, here's why he says he gives them an example. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. In other words, if you think about it long enough, the only reason why you eat me <laughs> it's because God is good. <laughs> if you think about it long enough, the only reason why you have what you have and the places that you've been is only because God is good. Listen, you don't have to understand all of this Jesus stuff yet. You don't have to understand God. You don't have to have flowery theological language. Just think about it long enough. The reason why you have food on your table, even when you lost your job, is because God is good. He says, you know what, you probably don't understand all this, but, but let, me, let me give you an example of how I can show you that God is who he is, says he is. He says, he sends rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts, even through all the stuff that you've been through, all the drama, all the mess, all the messiness that you've been through, you're still here today, you're still standing, the devil didn't take you out, because God is good. Paul has a specific strategy. He says, you know what, let me, when I talk to the Jews, let me talk about the God of history. It's before you even realized who God was. He chose you. And then he went to the Gentiles and said, you know what, God has always been in your history. You may have been worshiping something else, but the only reason why you still stand is because God has been in your history. And then we move to what I think is probably the most historical moment in this movement called the church. Acts chapter 15, we saw the video, the council at Jerusalem. And what they began to discuss was the fact that there were so many Gentiles that were coming to know Jesus, and there were so many churches that were popping out that were primary, primarily Gentile churches. And, and here's the reality. Luke records it in Acts. He says that there were some factions of the nation of Israel that become, became jealous. They said, wait a minute, this is our thing. <laughs> This is all about us. And if you want to be down with us, you got to be initiated. If you want to be down with what, what we have going on, remember Jesus is, is Jewish, and if you're going to be part of this new movement, then you guys, you saw it in the video, then you have to begin to submit yourself to the laws that we follow. And I don't know if you picked up on it in the video, there was a lot of tension that was surrounding this decision because there were many people who felt like these people are trying to take over. I'll, I'll leave that alone. And all of a sudden, a decision had to be made about what it really meant to be a follower of Jesus. See, many of us, you don't have to raise your hand. You probably grew up in a church like I did that made you feel like if you don't do ABC, you're not one of us. And if you don't dress like this, you're not one of us. And if you don't memorize 187 verses a week, then you're not one of us. And if you don't know how to articulate things in the way that we want you to articulate them, if you don't believe in our polity and our doctrine, you're not one of us. And this didn't start with our churches. It started way back then when the Jewish people said, you know what, if you want to be down with Jesus, you got to come through us. And how many times do we have churches who are, that are set up specifically to filter out the people who we think we want to be a part of our body and exclude people from Jesus. Look, you got to go through this class, and then we need to teach you this, and then you got to learn that, and then before you can be a member, you got to memorize this mission statement and this vision statement, and then also you got to memorize this scripture and that scripture, and then you got to take a test. We need to know your gifts, and we need to know this, and before you know it, people don't even want to be involved with Jesus. And so the issue now becomes, 
if Jesus said preach the gospel to all nations, does that mean that we have a monopoly on the grace of God? <laughs> Y'all missed it. Because remember the God of history? <laughs> The God who, who blessed you even when you didn't deserve it. Remember the God in your history? And after Paul teaches all these things, you have a whole section of people who refuse to admit that the only reason why I am why I am is because of his grace. Who are you to decide who gets God's grace? And so Paul now has, he has an issue. He says, you know what? We need to deal with this thing because we have a lot of people who are saying that the Gentiles cannot be Christians unless they become Jews. And Jesus said, preach the gospel to all nations. And so Paul's position is there should be no restrictions on this whole thing. We have no monopoly on this movement. That it is for everyone. It's, what's interesting is, is that in the book of Galatians, chapters 1 and 2, we can see Paul's version of this Jerusalem council. And Paul, you know, I love Paul, but Paul, <laughs> Paul was a little bullheaded. <laughs> So you get home, read Galatians 1 and 2, read his version of it. It's a little bit different than Luke's version of it. Where he says, you know what? I made the decision, and James and those other guys, these so-called pillars of the church, they didn't have anything to add to what I said. I, I, I decided that there's no restrictions. But Luke records this, this council in the, in the book of Acts chapter 15. is mirrored in Galatians 1 and 2, remember. And here's, here's the problem, that even though in Acts chapter 10, Peter admits that God has given the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. You remember the story of Cornelius? And even though Peter admits that, they still have a problem with accepting folks. Now, I don't want to stay there too long because you know where I'm going. But the last thing that the church should be having to debate is who we want to have come through our doors. Look, I know we can fight about a lot of things. I know that we can have issues with a lot of things. I know that we have to work out a lot of issues. But the last thing that we should be fighting about is who's welcome. And Paul says, look, I know that we got a lot of stuff to work out. But the one thing that is absolutely obvious is that Jesus said that everybody who believes on him should be saved. There are no restrictions to this movement. And so Paul says, look, we, we got we to gotta get this thing straight. And a strong argument was made by the, by the Gentile converts that they must be, or by the Jews, that the Gentile converts must practice Jewish laws. Did you notice in the video, and, and Paul talks about this in Galatians, did you notice that he brought with him Titus, who was a non-Jew? And did you notice in the video the tension that we're not even supposed to be sitting with you let alone considering letting you a part of our church. So if you want to be a part of us, you need to be circumcised. I'm not going to teach that. Don't worry about it. But did you notice the tension? Here, here's what I, what I love about what Paul did. It's harder to reject people to their face. See, it's easy to talk about those people, and it's easy to talk about who should and shouldn't be here when they're not here, but I dare you to look somebody in the eye, somebody that God created, and tell them that they're not worthy of his grace. Paul, Paul was a smart guy. He said, you know what, I'm going to take Titus with me, and I dare you. <laughs> I dare you to look him in his face and say you're not worthy. And he takes Titus, and they have this conversation. You see it in the video, and they have this discussion about who is allowed to be a part of the church. Let me read you just a little bit of how that discussion took place. Acts 15, verses 8 through 11. And here's how it kind of, how they kind of summarize this when they get up to speak. He says, God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them for he cleansed their hearts through faith. Now check this out. He says, so why are you challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? In other words, he says, you so adamant that they need to follow the rules, the same rules that we couldn't even keep. Because the, the system that they were set up on presupposed that they would fail. That's why they had sacrifices. And so every year they had to repent of their sins and sacrifice an animal because God already knew y'all can't keep the law. 
And now Paul is saying, look, why are you trying to impose a burden on people who are trying to come to Christ? The same rules that we couldn't even follow, you're trying to make them follow. You ever had somebody that's just a hypocrite? <laughs> just kind of do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> And Paul's problem is, is you're asking these Gentiles to, to do something that we couldn't even do. The whole reason why we need Jesus is because none of us can keep the law. Why are you trying to make people follow rules that you can't even follow? And Paul says, look, why are you testing God? Why, why are you challenging God? It's not even about them, but when you begin to try to make people follow rules in order to follow Jesus, you're testing God. And if you want the God of history and the God in history to continue to write his story, then we have to understand that you cannot challenge God on what God says is good. Paul says, look, you're challenging God by burning the Gentiles with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. And we believe, here comes that word again, we believe that we are all saved, all of us, Jews, Gentiles, male, female, black, white, Asian, we're all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so don't get it twisted, homeboys on the block. Look, I'm one of you, but let me don't get it twisted. You're saved the same way that the Gentiles are saved. You're not any better. You're not any different. You're not any more special. Yeah, you, we are the chosen people, but here's how we all are saved. Here's what it boils down to. We all received a grace that we don't deserve. And if you got grace that you didn't deserve, then who are you to decide that somebody else can receive the Lord's grace. And Paul, look, when you go home, read Galatians 1 and 2, because Paul comes off really strong in his letter. <laughs> Just say, look, Paul says there's no male, no female, no Jew, no Gentile, all that stuff, all the things that you've been tripping on about this movement. If you want to be a part of God's story, quit tripping and allow God to do his thing. And he says, look, that, that's not a part of who we are. This is, this is a new movement. And so James finally stands up, Acts 15 and 19, and he says this, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating off food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. In other words, James says, in order for us to kind of keep peace, we're not going to impose any of our rules on them, but in order for there to be peace between the two factions, here's just a couple of things we want you guys to try not to do in front of your Jewish fellows. James says, here's, here's the deal. We need to make sure, and here's, here's where it's going to hit us, New Community Church, we need to make sure that as a church and as a church that is being written in the history of God's story that we don't make it difficult for people to come to Jesus. As James said, it's an open door and our job is to stay out of the way. Is to make sure that the things that we do and the things that we say and the way that we live and the rules that we have don't block people from coming to Jesus. Stay out of the way and let God do his thing. Now there's, there's six things I want to kind of run through this. There's six things this is not in the Bible, but I think that as we look at that Jerusalem council, as we look at God preaching about the God of history and the God in history, I think there's six implications. I call them six epic implications of this Jerusalem council. Y you ready? All right. Number, number one is that grace exposed the church. There, there's this story of a little girl. She was uh, crying one day, told her mom, Mommy, my stomach hurts. It hurts bad. And she said, you know what, darling, that's because your stomach is empty. All you need to do is get something in there, and it'll feel better. And so she fed the little girl, and about two weeks later, they were at church, and the pastor was talking to her mom, and he said, you know what, my head hurts. <laughs> and the little girl said, you know what, pastor? <laughs> that's because there's nothing in there. <laughs> and if you just get a little something up there, it'll stop hurting. <laughs> now, now, <laughs> Here's why that's important, because grace exposes us of both our ignorance and our arrogance. D -d Don't miss that. Because the fact that they had to finally come to the decision that we are saved by grace and grace alone, it exposed the fact that maybe we're not as smart as we think we are. 
And even though we have all these rules and these regulations and we're trying to make people be like us and we're telling people you got to be circumcised, you can't be a Christian unless you first become a Jew, we have all these systems and programs and maybe we think we're smart enough to grow this thing, but here's what grace does. It exposes both our ignorance and our arrogance. That when you realize that it's only because of God's grace, you realize I'm not that smart. And now that I realize that I'm not that smart, I can't be as arrogant as to think that I'm better than somebody else. And one of the things that the Jerusalem Council exposed is the fact that until this moment, the church was both ignorant of how God was moving and arrogant as though they were the only ones who could receive it. And here's a challenge for both of us, that for, for all of us, is to understand that we have to embrace the fact that it's only because of God's grace that we're a part of this story. Remember, the God of history and the God in history is trying to get us to abandon our story and live his story. D don't miss that. See, we create history when we live his story. And one of the ways that we begin to abandon ourselves is to understand that the grace has to expose me to the fact that I'm not as smart as I thought I was. The more and more I learn about God, the more and more I realize I don't know anything. And the fact that it exposes us to our ignorance also exposes us to our arrogance. Don't get offended, but some of us think we're so spiritual. Just say, ouch. <laughs> you ain't got to know I'm talking about you. Just look straight ahead and act like I'm not talking about you. <laughs> But some of us think we have more up here than we really have, and God is saying, if you just get out the way and let me do my thing, we can see this movement grow. I know you want a strategy, I know you want a philosophy and a mission statement and a vision statement, but if you just get out the way and allow my grace to be a wave that overwhelms this community, you'll watch the church grow. So the first implication is, is that it exposed the church. Here's number two. The church began to realize that it does not control grace, but it cooperates with grace. See, up until this point, you saw it in the video, Paul says, the only reason why you want people to keep the law is because you want to have a monopoly on God's grace. You want people to come through you to be saved. And what this decision shows us is that the church does not control God's grace. The church is only obligated to cooperate with God's grace. Because we're not in charge. If we want to live his story, if we want to make his story, we're not in control of who gets saved. And we're not in control of how God works in life. Here's, here's something that's not even in my notes. I'm going to give it to you for free. You're not in control of how God deals with your family members. You're not in control of how God deals with somebody on your job. That our job is simply to cooperate with what God is doing. Rick Warren says it like this, find the wave and ride it. The church understood for the first time that we don't, we don't control this. We don't have a monopoly. We are not the gate. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Get out of the way and let me save people. N number three, the gospel of grace was a decentralization of power. Here's what that means, that Jesus is the head of the church. My, 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 my son asked me last week, because we were locking up after our event, our backpack giveaway, and I guess he saw the keys, he asked me, he said, Daddy, are you in charge of the church? I said, <laughs> 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 don't put that on me. <laughs> no, why do you ask that? Because you have keys. I said, that just means I can get in. <laughs> I am not in charge of the church. Jesus is in charge of the church. And the Bible over and over and over again tells us that Jesus is the head of the church. The church is his bride. Jesus is absolutely in charge. And here's what grace does. It decentralizes power to the point where all of us realize that none of us are in control and Jesus is in charge. See, part of the problem was is that when they had all their rules and their regulations, then you had a certain group of people who got to decide whether or not somebody broke those rules, and you got a certain group of people who decided what the penalty is for those rules. And before you know it, you have a whole group of people who were in charge of the church. 
And usually it's a minority group of people. It is a small group of people who control everything that happens in the church. And here's what the gospel of grace did. It decentralized the power to understand that none of us are in control and Jesus is in charge. So if you want to know who gets in, ask Jesus. If you want to know who's worthy, ask Jesus. If you want to know who to accept, ask Jesus. Because the gospel of grace, the gospel that Paul was beginning to preach and the understanding that the church is about preaching the gospel of grace, it began to help people understand that we really are not in control of this movement. If we want to make history, we got to get out of the way and let Jesus be in charge. N number four is that removing restrictions for new converts, it humanized the Gentiles. It made them equally as valuable to Jesus in this church movement. Here's why I think Paul, we talked about it a little earlier, I think Paul took Titus because it's hard to discriminate against somebody when you look across them and look in their eyes. And what's so valuable about having a diverse church is that it means that at some point we have to understand that we're all created in God's image. And the humanization of the, of the Gentiles, it meant that, you know what, we're not going to we're not going to belittle you and degrade you and make you try to follow a bunch of rules that we ourselves cannot follow, but we understand that you are created in God's image just like us, and you have received God's grace just like us, and so now you have full rights and privileges in this movement. We're trying to create history, and that means that we got to treat people the same. It's quiet, so I'm going to move on. No, number five. Transformation happens when we allow God's grace to challenge unquestioned Truth. And this is this is tough. Th there's a story about this this woman who lived next to this old lady, and she used to call her Old Miss Robinson. And she hadn't seen her in several days, and she started to worry about her. So she told uh, she told her son, you know, I want you to go across the street and see how old Miss Robinson is. And so a little boy ran across the street, came back in about ten minutes, and said, you know what? Um, I've never seen her so mad. And she said, why? She said, because she told me it's no business how old. I am. <laughs> some, some of y'all missed it. <laughs> See, he got it wrong. He misunderstood. And here's what the gospel of grace does. It causes us to begin to question areas that we think are true or that we've been getting wrong for a long time. Now, sometimes in church, we have erroneous things that we have passed off as truth that has nothing to do with Jesus. And the fact that Paul says, look, just because we have rules and just because we have regulations and just because we have all these different hoops we want people to jump through, let's sit back and question whether or not that's really true. Does that make you saved? Does that really make somebody saved just because they can follow the law? Does that really make you saved because you wear a suit in church? Does that really make you saved just because you go to Sunday school every morning? I'm just saying. And sometimes grace and teaching grace will help us to understand there's probably some areas of erroneous truth that I need to question. There's probably some areas in my life that has stopped the gospel from being globalized. Here's why that's important, because it can't be globalized. People can't come to know Jesus as long as we have areas that we're not willing to question whether or not that's blocking people from Jesus. And the globalization of the gospel came as a result of them understanding that you know what, maybe doing all that stuff really doesn't make you right with God. Maybe it actually is faith and faith alone that makes us right with God. If we want to live his story, if we want to be a part of creating history, we have to understand that in order for this thing to go out across the world, we've got to understand that maybe there's some things that we've been doing that we thought were right that are actually blocking people from knowing Jesus. That's, hard. That's a hard pill to swallow, but it's true. No, no, number six is that his story, no, notice how his, his rating is, his story is made when we let go of our story. Here's where I'm going to end. So we have to understand how difficult of a situation this had to be. Because for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, here are people who followed a certain set of rules and regulations and just knew that that was how things were supposed to be. And they had to be willing to let go of their story at the risk 
of the fact that it would totally be taken over by something else. Because isn't it ironic that the thing that they tried to protect themselves against ended up being what allowed the gospel to spread? Do you notice that now Christianity is a primarily Gentile religion? And sometimes if we want to go to the next level, if we want to make sure that God is writing his story, we've got to be willing to allow ourselves to totally detach ourselves from our own story, even if it means it comes out looking like something totally different than what we expected. And that's hard, isn't it? Because we want to be in control. And the very thing that they were trying to do is the very way that God accomplished his mission. They had to let go of everything that they were attached to because their mission was to make this thing a movement. And here's my challenge for you, maybe even individually. If you think that there's a part of your story that's going to create history without you letting go, we're sadly mistaken. That it's a part of the fact that God has extended us grace, that it challenges us to let go of our story and to become part of his story. That there are parts of my life where I have to say, you know what, God, I have to let go, even if that means that somewhere in the background of my life, Things won't turn out just the way that I thought they would. It might be something completely different from what I expected. As a matter of fact, I might end up not even be the main character of the story. But the decision that they had to make, now don't, get, don't, don't make it seem like it's so simple because these are people who held tightly to their traditions, they held tightly to their law, they held tightly to everything that they thought was right, but for the sake of the gospel, I'm willing to let all that stuff go if it means somebody gets to know Jesus. That's what makes the church epic, is that it comes to a realization that even though we may have been doing something a certain way for 20 years, if it means that more people get to know Jesus, God, I let it go. If it means that I'm blocking this thing from spreading like the wildfire it was designed to do, if it means that I'm writing my story instead of participating in his story. If it means that people are not able to see who Jesus is because I'm so adamant that it has to be my way, God, help me to let it go. And the reason why that's epic is that's why you're sitting in the seat you're sitting today. Is that people who are willing to let go of something that they practiced for hundreds of years so that you can know Jesus. So here's my challenge. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask Pastor Larry to come out. Here's our challenge as a church. That if there's anything that we do individually as families or as a church that stops the church from growing, that stops us from being a part of his story, let's let it go. Because Jesus said, preach the gospel to all nations. Sometimes that means that we don't, hold on to our story but we gotta participate in creating his story let's pray God we thank you and we love you so much and if there's any way God that we have been holding on to traditions and erroneous truth and things that are blocking people from knowing Jesus help us to examine our lives and our hearts and help us to be the kind of epic church that says we will do whatever it takes to make sure people know Jesus even if that means that we no longer become the main character of the story. God, help us to be the type of church that makes decisions like that was made in Acts chapter 15, that everybody is accepted, that there are no rules to experiencing God's grace, and if we have set up any systems, any programs, anything that we have done as a church that has blocked people from knowing Jesus, help us, God, to become a part of your story. And God, we thank you that we can see you all throughout our history. We thank you that we can see your grace working in all the areas of our life, even when we didn't understand who you were. And help us to make that the gateway into knowing you. Help us to be a church that preaches grace and grace alone. God, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.